All right. Uh, welcome to everyone, and I'm pleased that you could join us for what I hope will be at least an informative bit of time together. Uh, by way of introduction, my name is Eric Rhodes, and I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Horizon Discovery. I have a fairly expensive background in gene editing, having spent uh, a good deal of time involved with zinc finger nucleases, both at Sangamo Biosciences and later at Sigma Aldrich. And I hope I can shed some light on yet a different approach to gene editing, the use of recombinant adeno-associated virus. Here's what I hope to cover today, and as Joe mentioned, I'll pause in the middle to give people a chance to ask questions, but you can use the chat box if you'd like to ask questions in the interim. First, just a bit of historical background. So initial attempts to use homologous recombination, the cell's natural high-fidelity DNA repair mechanism, revolved around the generation of transgenic mice using plasmid-based techniques in embryonic stem cells. This approach, while it was fine for transgenic mice, it really isn't effective for the development of somatic cell lines because there are very, very low rates of homologous recombination in somatic cells. Instead, the process needs to be stimulated, for an, or you have to use some sort of alternative approach, and that's what we're here to talk about today. An alternative to homologous recombination involves the use of nucleases to create a double-stranded break, and, and that gives you a break at a specific location. And then that uses a more error-prone, non-homologous end-joining mechanism to repair that break. And I'll be talking a little bit about that when we do some uh, comparisons of technologies. Examples of that are zinc finger technology, the zinc finger nucleases, uh, transcription activator-like effector nucleases, or talons, and engineered meganucleases. Horizon's approach, however, is to amplify the basal levels of homologous recombination by about 1,000 to 10,000 fold through the use of recombinant AAV technology. Wild-type AAV is a small, single-stranded DNA virus, and it belongs to the parvovirus family. It's actually non-replicative by itself, and it requires help from other viruses, <coughs> excuse me, like adenovirus or herpes virus in order to replicate. AAV is non-pathogenic, and it's not currently known to be associated with any human diseases, although the majority of us are seropositive for the virus. The genome of AAV is very small. It is only about 5 kb in length. The structure of the wild-type virus is shown here and consists of three main components. The two ITRs, or inverted terminal repeats, which form a hairpin structure in single-stranded single form. They protect the ends from nucleus activity and are believed to play a role in the recruitment of certain cellular factors. Then there are two open reading frames, REP and CAP. The REP open reading frame plays a role in replication of the virus, while the CAP ORF encodes proteins that make up the capsid of the virus. When AAB particles come into contact with the cell, they bind to receptors or receptor complexes on the surface of the cell, and they enter primarily through receptor-mediated endocytosis. The virus gets shuttled through the cell in a variety of ways. But after that, a significant portion of the infecting particles actually make their way to the nucleus where the DNA payload gets released from the capsid. One of the principal features of AEV is its ability to efficiently transduce a wide variety of mammalian cell types. So the capsid protein is what determines which receptors the virus binds to on the cell surface. There are a number of naturally occurring AAV serotypes which have been identified, and they're typically numbered, like AAV1, AAV2, et cetera, up to about 12. Serotype 2 is the most widely used in research applications, and it's effective at transducing about 80% of mammalian cells right now. But given the complete collection of serotypes, about 90% of all mammalian cell types can be transduced effectively with one form of AAV or another. There are some chimeric or synthetic capsids as well, and uh, they've shown wide tropism as well, but I'm not going to talk too much about those today. So making RAV. What, uh, the real difference between wild-type AAV and recombinant AAV it essentially is really just the difference that the rep and cap proteins have been replaced with some other DNA payload, which the virus can then efficiently deliver to the nucleus. That payload can be any number of things, and I'll address the, the most common uses in a moment. 
Creating an RAA vector is as simple as putting a piece of DNA between these two viral ITRs on a plasmid. In order to package up that payload into the capsid, we use a packaging cell line. It's usually HEK293, which is already transformed by adenovirus, so it expresses the adeno E1A gene, which is necessary for the AAV replication. Three plasmids are routinely transfected into the cell. The first is the AAV vector itself, which is really just a DNA payload located between the two ITRs. Then two helper plasmids are also added. One codes for the cap and rep proteins, and the other it expresses other helper virus proteins to boost replication. This process takes only about one day, and the packaging cell line sheds the AAV particles, which contain that single-stranded DNA payload. So what are the most common payloads? Well, one common use of AAV is to introduce a heterologous protein into a cell and make it express that gene. The example shown here uh, shows the CMV promoter driving expression of an IGF-1 cDNA, for example. Obviously, this could be almost any protein, provided it fits within that packaging limit of AAV. The second use of AAV, and the one we've all come together today to discuss, is the use of uh, AAV for gene targeting. The graphic here shows a hypothetical targeting vector. It consists of a genomic region derived from a target cell line, and in this case, a SNP mutation is being introduced into exon 6 of the gene. It's common to include a positive selection marker, in this case neomycin, introduced into an intronic region where its presence is generally inconsequential. So here's how the HR reaction takes place. Recombination occurs between the homology arms and the target region within the genome. The HR gets resolved in the two homology arms, effectively excluding the ITRs because they share no homology with the target region. In this particular case, you see an example of using a splice acceptor placed just upstream of the puromycin selection kit set so as to enrich for correct targeting. It's possible for the entire payload, including the ITRs, to randomly integrate into a site if there's a double-strand break somewhere in the cell. But using this approach, the one here with the splice acceptor site, it would be very highly unlikely that that puro gene would then be expressed from such a random integration event. So that's why one way among many that we have for selecting against those random uh, events. So what, what does AAV do really to drive gene targeting? Uh, the, the difficult uh, question really is nobody knows, or the, the hard thing to say is that nobody really knows yet. You'd think we would, but we don't. What has been demonstrated empirically is that recombinant AAV is 1,000 to 10,000 times more efficient than the use of other forms of DNA, whether that be single-stranded DNA or double-stranded DNA or even other viral vectors. There's still controversy over whether it's the single or double-stranded form of the virus that's responsible for initiating HR. What is known is that it is pure and simple HR that occurs, which means the recombination reaction is very precise and highly controllable with regard to the outcome. It also means that there's a broad range of modifications that can be undertaken when you use this approach. Here are some examples of the type of modifications that have been performed using AAV targeting. So on the top, you can see there are point mutations. This is pretty much in line with the, the vectors that I've shown you already. You can introduce a single codon change into an exon. You can do an RNAi rescue. This is the idea that you have an SH RNA, for example, in a cell line, and you want to make sure that it is specifically targeting a particular exon that you're looking at. What you can do is go in and change the codons within that exon at the endogenous level so that the RNAi will no longer function and bind to that particular uh, locus. Another thing you can do is insertional gene disruption. So you can stick anything you want, but obviously a selectable marker is something that, that works very well right into the, into the middle of an exon, for example, disrupting the coding sequence there. On the other hand, if you want to get rid of a whole exon, you can do that as well. Your flanking sequences can be to the intronic regions that flank an exon, and you can basically loop out that exon. So you can do a complete gene deletion. You can do an exon deletion. We've so far achieved a removal of about a 100 KB piece in a single move. Uh, you can also do long-range deletions, and this involves essentially doing things like putting pre-locks with LOX-P sites flanking a large genomic region and then using the Cree enzyme to then loop that out. 
We've also been successful with translocations between different chromosomes, same approach of using the LOXP, or doing inversions within a chromosome, for example. Amplifications is another area where we can, for example, put an SV40 DNA origin in and then using large T antigen amplify up a region of that DNA. So um, it's very flexible. There's actually quite a bit of things you can do in terms of genome editing using this technology. To date, we've targeted over about 100 different human genes, and this includes numerous point mutations within many of these genes. So quite a few projects have been undertaken with the technology, and it's very robust. Uh, over 70 different cell types have been targeted so far using AAV, and these are just a few of those lines that we've used, not the complete list. All right, let's get a little bit into the comparisons and, and some of the competitive discussion here. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about hey, how AEV stacks up against these other gene editing approaches. So there really are three main gene editing platforms aside from AAV. Zinc finger nucleases, talons, and meganucleases. Uh, zinc fingers and talons are really very similar. They both use a modular DNA binding domain approach, both use a type 2S cleavage domain, and both require heterodimer formation in order to introduce a break. Meganucleases, on the other hand, are monomeric, but they have been plagued by engineering problems. They're limited in their flexibility and broad application. One thing shared by all three platforms is they function through the introduction of a double-stranded break into the genome. What happens when you introduce a double-stranded break is that the cell immediately goes into repair mode. So there's two competing mechanisms within the cell that attempt to fix that break. One of the mechanisms is known as non-homologous end joining, or NHEJ. And it's really just quite simply where the cell immediately glues the two broken ends back together. The ends are sometimes chewed back or filled in prior to being ligated back together. And this can result in a collection of random alterations at the cut site. This can be advantageous if the only thing you need is a disruption of the coding sequence. And nucleases are admittedly very good at this, provided you don't need a defined alteration. The other repair pathway is homology-directed repair, or HDR. And this is an HR-driven process that attempts to find a suitable template from which to copy and paste any of the missing information back into the cut site. This approach can be used to introduce small genetic changes or insert foreign DNA. But one confounding factor when you're using nucleus is that each cell type appears to have a different balance of NHEJ to HDR. And it can be particularly difficult to drive that HDR reaction in some cell types. And that makes targeting changes through HR uh, quite a challenge, actually. Um, just These are some of the limitations of using a nuclease-based uh, approach. I think most of you have probably heard some of these and through the literature. They do, at times, suffer from specificity concerns. Uh, there's less control over the outcome, like I just said. If you're using them for a disruption through NHEJ, it's very likely that you can identify a disruption which has interrupted the coding sequence, but you have no control, really, over what that disruption is going to look like. And there's always this NHEJ versus HR mix. And it's very hard to bias the cell in one direction, solely in one direction. So sometimes, particularly for knock-ins, there's a greater level of screening that's required. Uh, delivery is also potentially an issue, depending on the type of cell you're working with. ES cells, for example, are particularly resistant to transfection, uh, neural cell types, hematopoietic cells, certain ones. Any difficult to transfect or electroporate cells can be an issue when trying to use a nucleus-based approach because essentially you need to get, for the most part, you're trying to get a plasma DNA in there or a piece of RNA. Um, for further looking at this issue of NHEJ versus homology-directed repair and how that balance can affect outcomes, here's a graphic that illustrates at the top all of the potential outcomes that are possible when you're using nucleus for a knock-in or editing reaction. So obviously, you can have no effect. You could introduce essentially a knockout or a disruption, that's what the X represents, into a single allele. You could get a double allele knockout by having disruption on both alleles. You could get the targeted insertion in one allele and a knockout in the other allele. You could get a single allele knock-in. You could get a double allele knock-in, which is probably what you're trying to get. And then because of the specificity concerns, you always have to just have some concern over whether there's been some sort of off-target mutation or a in, uh, random insertion of the donor that you've put into that cell. So there's many possible outcomes. 
And it's just you have to keep this in mind when you're planning how you're going to screen for a knock-in using a nucleus approach. If you're using an AV, which is strictly HR dependent, down on the bottom you can see either you're going to have no effect, you're going to get a single allele knock-in, you could get a double allele knock-in, we talked about that a little bit, and you can get a random insertion, but we have ways for screening against those random insertions. And so it is a much simpler process, it's much more controlled, and it's the screening uh, necessary when you're using an AAV approach is really a bit simpler. An example of where using AAV in a knockout situation really can be beneficial is shown here. A, a critical amino acid has been identified, for example, within a gene, and simple disruption of that gene leads to lethality. Using recombinant AAV, one of the alleles can be completely deleted while the other is rendered conditionally expressed. If you introduce LOXP sites flanking the exon, for example, the exon can be purposely deleted upon transient use of CRE, and a full population of cells can then be investigated with this change. Another example, not shown here, but also relevant, pertains to a situation where you have a gene that has two inherent activities. For example, a protein may have both an enzymatic and a scaffolding function, meaning it binds to or it interacts with other proteins independent of its enzymatic activity. So using one-step RAAV targeting, the enzymatic activity can be neutralized by altering the active site of the enzyme, but leaving the protein intact so that the scaffolding function is still there to work for you. <clears throat> Here's a chart that compares several of the parameters of gene editing. Genesis is the most efficient knock-in approach with a much greater level of flexibility. Nucleases, on the other hand, do have a slight edge when it comes to knockouts, provided there's a simple random disruption of the target gene is all you need. Genesis's ability to introduce a broad scope of changes spread across several KB in one step, I feel, gives it an advantage in the more complex and spatially dependent situations. Because Genesis relies solely on HR, it's the most precise targeting platform, really, that you could use. Specificity, ah, excuse me, specificity will always lurk in the background of any, any editing that you do with a nuclease-based method. At Horizon, we're working on improved selection methods, as I mentioned, and ways of further enhancing HR activity to improve the gene targeting efficiencies. A year ago, the efficiencies averaged about 1%. But through implementation of some of these changes and enhancements, we're now routinely seeing efficiencies in the 20 to 30% range. This allows us to reduce the level of screening to identify correctly targeted clones, and it brings, as I mentioned, biallelic targeting into play. One of the historic knocks in this technology really is that it was slow, but this is no longer the case, and we've begun to work on putting some of these enhancements into a kit format, which we hope to make broadly available in the future. So before we close, I'd just like to give a short introduction to Horizon, show how we're using Genesis to drive certain research applications. Um, Horizon was founded about five years ago by oncologists with a goal of making use of the wealth of genome information that is becoming available and enabling that information to drive better therapeutic outcomes. We truly believe this information can help get the right drugs to the right patients at the right time. While a wealth of genetic information is available and disease-causing variations are being rapidly discovered, there are still few models that accurately reflect the patient variation and allow a systematic evaluation of those genetic changes. So much stands to be gained by a better understanding of how new drugs interact with these genetic variations. This is where Genesis comes into play. We are using Genesis to derive isogenically matched cell lines that differ only at a single locus. So we've taken parental cell lines and precisely introduced mutations reflected in those patient populations, and then those can be used to screen drugs for their efficacy, excuse me, efficacy against those patient populations. We've expanded upon that actually to include other services and products derived from genome-edited cells. Our capabilities span this range from basic research, looking at the effects of a mutation on growth, just for example, to recreating a tumor microenvironment to examine the effects of some of these changes and what they would have under specific conditions. Profiling drugs against patient populations and determining which, which patients are expected to respond and which ones may not is another key activity that we undertake. We've also expanded the range of our products to include genomic DNA extracted from these engineered cells, which serves as reference standards in the diagnostics industry. <clears throat> 
Here's an example <clears throat> of where we've introduced a range of common cancer mutations into an isogenic background and then tested drug compounds to demonstrate how some genetic lesions can be more sensitive or resistant to treatment. We've also partnered with Promega to fuse their proprietary halotag and nanoluciferase reagents to endogenous genes, and that empowers a broad range of screening activities. Here's an example of where the halotag, for example, was fused to the endogenous KRAS gene, and it was used to then follow trafficking of that protein in live cell imaging. We work with a broad variety of pharma, biotech, and academic customers, and some of those are shown here. But the technology is very, very widely used, and I would hope that with this introduction you have a better understanding of how it might be applied and hopefully encourage you to maybe look a little further into our website to see some of the products that we've developed. Here's just a summary slide showing the range of products and services based on this. We, starting at the top here, we do custom cell line development, if any of you were wondering about that. We use the Genesis technology in a fee-for-service type of offering. We also then, moving down to the right, say X-Men isogenic cell lines. These are the paired cell lines, the parental, and then the mutant version of that parental that I mentioned to you. We have now over 400 off-the-shelf off cell line pairs. These X-Men reporter kits, for example, the luciferase tags, the halo tags that I mentioned to endogenous pathways are another one of the product offerings. We have these X-Men molecular reference standards, if you're involved at all in uh, looking at ways to make sure that all of the machinery you have are actually, is actually performing up to snuff or uh, working in the diagnostic field. We also have a target identification and validation uh, arm. We're using high throughput siRNA and shRNA target discovery uh, and then combining that with the genesis to then make these alterations at the endogenous level for those genes that are showing up through screens and using this then to identify new drug targets. We have a discovery research service arm as well. This is really just a CRO type of service where we include the use of all of the different X-Man isogenic cell lines and the custom cell line development services and then combine that to provide basically a, you know, all, all work done for all people type of thing. And we've also now recently launched a, a new effort in the bioproduction space, the engineering of CHO cells. You've probably heard about this using some of these other technologies. And we are using this primarily with a, the strength and the knock-in to be able to deliver genes into particular regions of the genome uh, for high level of expression of antibodies and other types of proteins. 